Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution uh, Foundation event. Now, we're here to talk about wealth, the, um, what's happening to it, what might happen to it in future, how uncertain is the level of household wealth in this country, and what happens when big trends like that wealth, having been growing for the last four decades, go into reverse. And then getting to the really hard bit, which is what does that mean for policymakers? How should we think about a world where wealth goes up or wealth goes down or is uncertain in, in, in its future levels? And what does that mean for how we save for pensions, how we uh, build up assets in housing and the rest? And a bit of what does that mean for different generations? Now, we're obviously doing all of that because something large is going on right now, which is interest rates having been coming slowly down for the last four decades have decided to go up sharply. So that's the backdrop to what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a bit about the short-term effects of that in terms of people's savings and their mortgages. Hands up in the room. People are looking quite young in the room, but hands up in the room if you've got a mortgage. The, um, okay, he's a minority. I can see some outright owners, and I can see some would-be mortgagees. Are you youth? Not a mortgage yet? Okay, that's good. Just wait a little bit. There, there's some good news for you later. Or, okay, all right. The, um, uh, anyway, so that is the plan for today. And we're doing that because as part of our ongoing partnership with the Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust into wealth in Britain, and in particular, what that means for policymakers, we today published Peaked Interest. You see what the team did there. The, um, which is a long, detailed report in digging into what does the surge in interest rates mean for household wealth and how should we think about it. The, um, so you're first of all going to hear from... Ian Mulhern, who's a research associate here at the Foundation, one of the authors of today's report. And then we've got a great panel. You're going to hear from David Miles, who, as well as being the uh, member of the um, uh, Office for Budget Responsibilities Committee and setting the forecast that the Chancellor relies on to make fiscal decisions in every budget or autumn statement, is also a professor of finance and economics at Imperial College Business School and has done a lot of the work over decades the, the kind of work we're doing on household wealth draws on so it's exactly the right person to have with us and then we've got claire barrett who's consumer editor at the financial times they um is self-identifying then um, uh, we know claire we all know who you are then um, and claire writes a lot about what the rise in interest rates is actually doing to the punters day in uh, day out some of which traumatizes you i don't always read it because sometimes it's a bit too stressful Oh, the, um, that's not, that's it's always good when I do read it, but sometimes it's just very stressful. The, um, so that is the plan, and then we're going to have uh, a time for a discussion until about 10.45. As always, go on to uh, Slido, it's hashtag rising rates, to put your questions in to make sure we get those, and we'll do a few polls on that afterwards. So that is the plan for this morning. Ian, what is in peaked interest? How should you peak our interest with this? So, well... Um, good morning, everybody. And um, we, we, we called the event from boom to gloom. But it's actually a much more positive story in that, especially for the younger people in the audience. So we just couldn't think of anything that ended with oom that was positive. Uh, but uh, there we go. So uh, just to start, I should thank uh, my co-authors, uh, Molly Broom and Simon Pittaway, um, particularly, I think, Molly for the title. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust, who've made this uh, work possible. OK, so first of all, let's... Um, now, I hope you've had your coffee because we're going to throw some very big numbers at you this morning. So uh, uh, get, get ready for that. And the first of them is this chart that you'll probably be quite familiar with, which shows that the UK has seen a surge in household wealth for the last 40 years. Uh, it's it typically bumbled around around 300 percent of GDP in total until the 80s. And then it started to take off. And before the uh, financial before the pandemic, rather, it peaked at just uh, it, was, it hit just over 700 percent. Uh, of GDP, um, a huge surge in wealth. Now, the pandemic has, and the uh, subsequent cost of living crisis has really scrambled that trend and changed a lot of things uh, about it. And the first thing that's changed is that we've seen very strong active savings. And I'm going to talk in terms of active savings in this presentation, which are people making a decision to save out of their income, and then passive savings, which is the changes in wealth through capital gains and things like that that happen irrespective of their deliberate savings decisions. Uh, so on active savings, you can see that during the pandemic, we had this unprecedented surge that uh, spike up in the amount people save because they couldn't spend anything, obviously. Uh, and then that came down in, in the cost of living crisis, but interestingly hasn't uh, regained the low levels it was at even pre-pandemic. And that's despite this 
very strong cost of living as, uh, crisis that we've had. So in aggregate, people are still seem to be saving, at least so far. Um, but there's quite a big uh, distributional story behind all that. So our survey uh, suggests that you know, in the first phase, the pandemic phase, you have this kind of a pattern of saving behaviour across the income distribution with households on the right and the, and the better off side of the distribution tending to save more and those on the left uh, uh, tending to save less, less even during the pandemic. But on the whole, people were saving. And then in the cost of living crisis, that picture has, that gradient has remained the same, but it's all shifted down. Most typical households have been dissaving, uh, but those at the top have still been saving uh, relatively strongly uh, on average. And that has been driving that uh, overall picture of uh, uh, relatively strong savings behaviour. So similar distributional picture in both with the less well off doing worse and the top uh, pulling the aggregate along. Uh, and of course, we're in a way, we're kind of moving into this third phase now where interest rates are rising as the Bank of England has been hiking interest rates. That's going to have a delayed impact on uh, the mortgage market, as we've uh, said a lot about in recent months, with a big mortgage hit coming down the line uh, for the younger people who are the people with these, these sort of salmon coloured bars. That's the, house, that's the mortgage debt holders who typically are in their 30s and 40s. Uh, and a bit in their 50s. Meanwhile, the people with deposits, the older uh, uh, um, retirees who tend to have uh, deposits are benefiting from those higher interest rates. Um, but all this active saving that's been going on um, has been huge and unprecedented. But in fact, it's relatively small in the grand scheme of things. It, it, the cumulative saving since the start of the pandemic has amounted to just 2% of uh, total existing household wealth. Uh, so really, the big story is in what's happened to passive wealth. Uh, and we've used the Wealth and Assets Survey to model how uh, wealth stocks have evolved, given what's happened to the price of the underlying assets. And when we uh, look at that, what we find is that there was a surge in asset values as interest rates fell, people saved at the start of the pandemic. It hit about 840% of GDP. And then it crashed as interest rates started to rise over 2022. In cash terms, that's wiped £2.1 trillion uh, off uh, household wealth. And, uh, and seen the, uh, we, we estimate that uh, wealth has now fallen to around 650% of GDP. And that is the biggest uh, fall in household wealth as a proportion of GDP since uh, the Second World War. Uh, and you can sort of see here, there's a bit of a complicated chart, but it gives you a sense of that surge and then fall again and the components of it. And you can see the blue bars, there was a surge in house prices. That's come off the boil a bit, but hasn't really fallen much. Uh, and then you can see the big drop is driven by uh, DB pensions and pensions in payment, the values of which have, uh, have gone uh, through the floor as bonds have crashed and um, uh, and that's not true to the, those valuations. So what we see here is that passive savings and passive wealth is very, very sensitive to what's happening uh, to interest rate shocks, which begs the question of, well, where are we going to go next? So we do two scenarios in our paper. Uh, the first is we take what investors are saying. We take what the markets are saying. Investors think that uh, in higher interest rates are here to stay. They might come down a bit after the current spike to, to, to deal with inflation, but they're going to remain relatively high compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, that's our first scenario. Our second scenario uh, is that a lot of economists think that all the forces that were driving down interest rates before the pandemic are still uh, here and with us and they're going to resume and if they do resume and if demographics and low growth and all those things continue to push down on interest rates uh, we could be in a very different world and here we model a simulation with a one percentage point further fall in interest rates compared to pre-pandemic levels. So what does this do? Uh, well under the no new normal scenario we get uh, wealth dropping to 550% of GDP, that's lower than anything since the financial crisis. And under the further to fall scenario, we get wealth surging past recent uh, highs to hit around 1,000% of GDP. Um, now, why does wealth fall further from where we are today? Well, bonds, the impact of interest rates on bonds and bond prices um, comes through immediately. But the impact on house prices is, uh, is lagged. So we need a way of working out what's the likely impact 
of interest rates on house prices. And to do that, um, we use a uh, what's called a user cost model. Now, we all know that if mortgage rates increase, that puts downward pressure on uh, house prices. Um, and a more kind of comprehensive way of thinking about that is there's always a, usually a gap between the yield you can get on residential property and the yield you can get uh, on uh, government bonds. And at the moment, that gap is very small, which suggests that something has to change, uh, probably prices having to fall or incomes having to rise or interest rates falling again in order to bring uh, house price valuations back into line with what we would expect them to be. And these kind of models you can see here um, tend to be quite good at predicting not short-term movements, they're terrible for that, but they are quite good at pointing out when house prices have been significantly overvalued and they've always tended to correct. And you can see uh, here in our latest estimate, we're back up at overvaluation peaks that we've seen back in the uh, 89 and in 2007. So that's a pretty scary place uh, to be. Um, uh, so what would that mean in terms of housing? Well, it should mean that we see significant improvements in housing affordability under our new normal scenario. So if interest rates remain high, we would expect uh, price to income ratios to fall back to about 5.6 times uh, average earnings from their peak at 8.9 recently. So that is a very different world from anything we've seen since the turn of the century, really, for housing affordability. But if interest rates were to fall further, you could see prices surging relative to earnings hitting uh, around 11 times earnings, and that would obviously make house prices in the 2010s look cheap. Um, OK, uh, but you might say, well, why does this all matter? You know, does it matter that pension valuations have gone through the fall or if people are getting their income guaranteed, they don't really mind if the pension wealth has changed? Well, one of the reasons higher or lower interest rates really matters is house price affordability, as we've just seen. But it also matters massively for pensions. Uh, so uh, before the uh, pandemic, with interest rates where they were then, um, the typical uh, middle-income person would have had to save about £5,000 to secure a two-thirds replacement rate in retirement to get two-thirds of their, their, their final salary. Um, but under today's interest rates, uh, that falls to about £3,000 they would need to save each year. So a massive reduction in what you need to save to achieve the same standard of living in retirement. Um, now, under our new normal scenario, interest rates come back up a bit, so that becomes £4,000, still a massively easier task than saving in the pre-pandemic world. But under a further to full world, it becomes almost impossible for people on middle incomes to save for a decent retirement on their own, as those contributions would, uh, would surge. So we can sort of think about putting it all together and think about um, uh, uh, aggregate household wealth as really the sum of people's life cycle savings, what they have to do over their entire life cycle to, to, to save, to build up savings so they can have a standard of living in retirement. And this chart shows uh, what the Wealth and Assets Survey has in terms of wealth by age. And you can see that before the pandemic, the, t the median uh, retiree household had about £620,000 worth of wealth, and that offered them a certain standard of living in retirement. And we can model what, that, what happens to that if uh, we have our low rates world. Well, that you'd need to amass about £480,000 uh, by retirement to achieve that same standard of living. Um, but in the further to full world, you need to amass well over £800,000. Now, this is huge. The uh, new normal is 17 times people's earnings. That's a lot, but it's a lot less than 30 times people's earnings in that uh, scary further to full world. And to put it in really simple terms, that means uh, if you're on the red line, there's a lot of avocado you can eat uh, in the uh, early years. But if you're on the green line, there's no avocado at all, I'm afraid. <laughs> OK, so quickly just to run through some of the implications uh, for this. Um, so what, this matters because asset price increases transfer wealth from young to old and their reverse does the opposite. So it's a major, driving or a major driver of household uh, living standards. Um, and it's all down to luck, which means that it's politically very potent because it feels unfair if you're on the wrong end of these kind of shifts. It also creates an asymmetry in the politics. Because if you are um, uh, older and you're seeing asset price rises, you don't feel any better off. The income streams you're getting from your assets haven't increased. 
But younger people definitely do feel worse off when they look at the price of the houses they have to uh, buy or the amount they have to save for their pension. And that risks putting big strains on politics if we see interest rates going uh, lower, re ret returning to pre-pandemic levels or even lower than that. So should policy do something about that? Should it lean against some of these shifts? Uh, well, some of, the, uh, some of the options you might think about here, we could think about in the housing market using macro prudential and fiscal tools to try and damp some of the effects from global interest rates on house housing. We could also tr look at ways of insuring households better through things like mortgage interest, long-term fixed rate mortgages. Uh, that would cushion some of the, the, the blows of these, this volatility. In pensions, we should probably think about reviewing the default contributions of, um, uh, of, of auto-enrolment so that they adjust when uh, rates of return uh, change. But we also need to think about the intergenerational risk-sharing mechanisms we've got. The state pension is the most obvious one, uh, but also things like collective defined contribution schemes help to spread some of that risk. And then finally, um, when valuation effects drive asset price changes, that has big implications for tax, and a comprehensive wealth agenda would need to uh, have a clearer view on, on tax. Now, when uh, valuations drive prices, it's not that people feel richer. As I say, the holders of those assets often don't feel richer. But when they sell those assets, they become richer, and it's at that point that tax should focus. So don't tax stocks of wealth in terms of annual, uh, an annual tax on the stock of your wealth, but do look at things like CGT and IHT as uh, a recent Resolution Foundation report stepped through in much more detail how we can do that. Uh, and together, that kind of an agenda could help us to deal with the fluctuations in interest rates and prepare us for some more volatility ahead. Thanks. Great, thank you, Ian. Great, right, there's a lot in there. And I promise you we're gonna come back at that. I was looking around the room as we're showing you like lots of asset price changes feeding through into forecasts. So we're going to go we'll, go, we'll go more slowly through some of the mechanisms that are driving some of those huge changes as we go and then get to the hard bit at the end, which is what does a, what does, what does a policymaker make of all this, given that it's all a bit complicated. David. Torsten, you're right. There's a lot in there. Um, this is a very rich paper. Uh, and it has a lot of things to say, a lot of very wise things to say, and raises a very large number of issues. Um, let, let me start out by saying a couple of things which I strongly agree with and I think are really important. The first is that if you look at the change, as the paper very nicely shows, if you look at the change in wealth relative to income for the whole economy, but also the distribution of wealth, in recent decades it's been driven much more by changes in what you might call the discount rate applied to the underlying asset. You could think of it as changes in real interest rates or more generally changes in the required rate of return on assets that generates big changes in the price of the assets. It's been driven much more by that than it has by actual savings into new assets. That's important um, partly because it, it slightly undermines, I think, the analysis of, of Thomas Piketty. P Piketty's book, which is all about rising inequality over time in wealth, said that the big driver here was that the return on savings was high, higher than the rate of growth of GDP, and therefore the accumulation of savings, predominantly by people with above average incomes and wealth, would just make the distribution of wealth more unequal. It is true that the total stock of wealth in the UK relative to income has until recently gone up a lot. But it's rather than being a reflection of lots of savings at high real rates of return, it's completely not that. It's a reduction in real interest rates, a reduction in the discount rate applied to things like houses, pensions, to some extent equities as well, which has driven up the stock of wealth. So the Piketty analysis is, actually gets it completely wrong. That's the first point the paper makes very nicely. I think another point it makes, and I'd make it even stronger in some, in some ways than the paper, is that that change in discount rates, which generates apparently huge changes in wealth, actually may have very limited, in many cases, impacts on the real resources people have when you look at their lives as a whole, and indeed look beyond their lives and the lives of their children and grandchildren if they want to leave money to future generations. 
In some ways, that's most obvious if you think about defined benefit pensions, where a change in real interest rates can apparently make enormous changes to the value of one's DB pension pot. But actually, with a DB pension, the amount of real resources you're going to get, which is linked to your past contributions, well, past salaries in many cases, actually doesn't change. I think something can be also, uh, you can develop that line of argument for changes in house prices. When real interest rates fall steadily, as they have for most of the last 40 years, it's not surprising that a long-lived asset like a house increases in value, because in some sense, the present value of the flow of services you get if you own the house, either the imputed income you get from living in your own house or the rent if you're a landlord, the value of that goes up when real interest rates go down. But the true value of that flow of services, how valuable is it to live in that house and enjoy its services, doesn't change very much. It's just the discount rate you apply uh, to it. Or another way to make the same point, for most people, if they enjoy a very large capital gain on the house, maybe in their 30s, 40s, 50s, the house, the next house they buy has just gone up in value by as much as the house they sell. And most people do move houses several times in their lives. Or looking even further ahead, if your aim is to pass on and bequest the next generation, and you've just enjoyed an enormous increase in the value of your house because interest rates have fallen, that's the story of the last 40 years, well, your kids are facing much higher, and, or grandchildren are facing much higher house prices. So there's a kind of a bit of economics jargon, Ricardian equivalence, which would say that bonds and fluctuations in their value don't generate real gains or losses. You could apply the same argument to houses. You could certainly apply it to DB pension schemes. So the paper makes those points in a very um, clear way, and I think that's very important. Um, and it's certainly an offset to what otherwise might seem a source of woe. We have enough sources of woe in the UK, which is that the value of wealth relative to GDP appears to have fallen a great deal. And I say appears to because then there's the question about, well, is it really a change in the resources that this country owns? And I think to a very large extent, the answer is no, because it's driven by changes in discount rates. And we've just seen a big increase in the real discount rate um, because of the increase in real interest rates, both at the short end and if you look at 10, 20, 30 year real yields on government bonds, um, they've also gone up fairly significantly. Where do I think the emphasis um, is not quite where I would place it um, in the paper? Um, or or maybe, maybe let me make the point in a different way, where I might put even more emphasis. One is what do we mean by wealth inequality? And there are two kinds of inequality in wealth. There's inequality that you could measure just by looking at the deciles. How much do the people who have the least amount of wealth hold in wealth? How much do the richest have? And that conflates two things, one of which is just a pure life cycle effect. Most people don't have much wealth when they're 25. They may have got a very big mortgage if they just bought a house, where the mortgage offsets the value of the house if you just bought it recently. You probably haven't built up much pension savings and you might have quite a lot of debt if you just come out of a university. Go ahead 30, 40 years, maybe you've paid off most of the mortgage, so you've got an unmortgaged house if you're lucky. Maybe it takes longer now, maybe it's 50 years. Um, you've built up a stock of pension wealth that probably wasn't there at 25 and maybe is very substantial at 65. So if you then look at a snapshot of the whole country, and you say, well, look, gosh, this is unbelievable inequality in wealth. Well, a lot of it is life cycle wealth rather than what you might call deviations from equality in the distribution of lifetime resources of the population. Now, it's not all that. Clearly, there are substantial differences in overall lifetime resources of different people. But just looking at snapshots of wealth don't quite bring that, well, not, not just don't quite, but they very substantially don't bring that out. And I think that has implications for taxation. Um, some forms of taxation of wealth, and in a broad sense, taxation of returns on wealth, wealth taxes themselves and taxes on inheritance, are ways of almost unwinding the ability of people to redistribute their labor income over their lifetime to smooth consumption. I think that should make one question 
asked some rather deep questions about the reliance on taxation of capital and wealth relative to labour income. There's an old and very famous paper in economics written by um, Ant the late Anthony Atkinson and Joe Stiglitz, in which they argue that taxation of capital, which is wealth, the return on wealth or wealth taxes, should be zero. Now, you might say, well, OK, who are these guys, Atkinson and Stiglitz? They must be some kind of right-wing neoliberal economists. Um, some people are smiling in the room because they will know that that is not a good description of Tony Atkinson <laughs> and Joe Stiglitz. If you wanted a non-economist to compare Stiglitz with, I'd say Bernie Saunders. If you wanted a non-economist to compare Tony Atkinson with, I'd say Ken Loach. So Ken Loach and Bernie Sanders, but really good at maths, that is Joe Stiglitz and Tony Atkinson. And their point was that you could use the taxation of consumption and labour income to get the distribution that you might see as more just. People will disagree on what that means. Um, and don't distort the life cycle choices of individuals about when they want to consume and how they want to smooth consumption and what they might want to do for future generations by taxing capital. And I think that's a very profound point. Um, incidentally, Tony Atkinson was in many ways the intellectual godfather of Piketty. So it's kind of um, ironic that perhaps one of the most famous papers ever written in the theory of taxation should say, don't tax capital. Um, at times, um, the report shows a sort of a guarded enthusiasm for taxation of um, wealth and income on wealth and bequests, but I think um, perhaps doesn't pay enough attention to this point uh, that Atkinson and Stiglitz raised. Um, let, me, let me accelerate a little bit, just make a couple of other points. Um, it's certainly true that big changes in real interest rates, such as we've seen recently, both up or down, change the ownership pattern of wealth by generation, becoming slightly more equal across the generations just in the last year or so because real interest rates have risen a lot, becoming less equal because of um, declining real interest rates for most of the last 40 years. And people talk about um, generational wealth inequality and the problems that rises. The paper is much more careful about that, much more careful than uh, much of what's said on it. Um, in some ways, I think that the intergenerational conflict story gets a little bit too much attention because much of the increase in wealth, particularly in the form of housing that we've seen over recent decades, is very likely to be passed down between the generations. And nearly all projections suggest that the amount of wealth beque bequeathed, I should say, bequeathed, um, will be dramatically higher over the next 10, 20 years than over the past 10, 20 years. Perhaps a little bit less high than we might have thought a year ago because of what may well happen to house uh, prices in, in, in a world of slightly higher real interest rates. Shall I hurry up, by the way? Am I right? Yeah. A couple of, I should hurry up. Okay. Um, my point here, very briefly, uh, stop rabbiting on. Um, <laughs> My point here, very briefly, is that in many ways it's better to see the issue thrown up by big changes in wealth, which of course tends to recruit to older people rather than younger people, to see that issue not so much as an intergenerational problem, but an intragenerational problem, because it's about who is it that's going to receive mm -hmm. the bequests. Um, let me just finally just say something, this will take me one minute, um, where... I think the paper raises really interesting issues, but where it's not quite clear what the right answer is. And they are on the potential benefits of long-term fixed rate mortgages and the potential benefits of so-called collective defined contribution. Fixed rate mortgages uh, do have the benefit, long-term fixed rate, but I don't mean the two and five year fixes that are very common in the UK, but long-term ones do of course insulate you almost by definition from fluctuations in nominal interest rates. But if you fix the rate for a really long period of time and then there are changes in inflation and what you fixed is the nominal rate, actually they can generate a lot of fluctuations in the real cost of debt. 
in an environment where inflation is as high as it is today, and when long-term nominal interest rates might be 6 7%, certainly on mortgages, 7% or more perhaps, long-term mortgages, locking in and then finding that actually inflation comes down again and incomes and nominal interest rates fall back to levels that we were used to up until a few years ago, you'd find you're actually locked in at a very high cost of debt. So the insurance component of long-term fixed rate mortgages, sure, they insure against some things, but not big changes in inflation and inflation expectations. Final point on collective uh, defined contribution schemes. There's a kind of slightly throwaway remark, to be fair, and the paper is not about collective defined contribution schemes at all. Um, but me, want to, not everyone will know what it's collect, collect, a quick version of what Collective defined about. contribution schemes... What, uh, the story is this. In, with, with a defined contribution scheme at the moment, you, you pay money in, it's invested in some assets. What pension you get at the end of it, or the stock of pension wealth you get at the point you want to draw it down later in life, depends completely on the return on the assets that you have invested in. Collective defined contribution schemes try to spread that, that rate of return risk, asset price risk, potentially across different generations, which sounds very attractive. Let's pool our risk across people of different ages. What it means, though, is that people aren't quite sure what they're going to get as a return in the way that you can, at least with a DC scheme, you can look up the value of the assets and say, OK, this thing's done really well or really badly over the last year or so. Um, and I kind of have a better idea where it's going. With collective defined contribution, you can, they're a bit like, for those of you with a decent memory, um, or older, um, with profits insurance contracts offered by the likes of Equitable Life. There's a name from the past, Equitable Life. You never quite For those knew, without a good memory, this is not meant to be a good thing. This is not meant to be a good thing. This is not meant to be a good thing. It didn't end well. And there's a, there's a sort of added problem with collective defined contribution schemes, which is that if things go badly wrong and the asset prices fall, what you're really asking is that younger contributors to the scheme should compensate the older who are about to retire. And that's fine if the young think that that's something they want to do, but if they don't, they'll pull out the scheme. So there's a built-in instability in collected defined contribution schemes. Let me stop at that point. You can sense from what I'm saying how many issues this paper raises. It's an excellent paper. Great. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, I told you Ian raised a lot of issues and David's added like another uh, 20. So we're going to try to vaguely do justice to this. Right, but first of all, Claire's going to... Claire, what is going on? OK, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the point that David made about this cascade of wealth managers, call it, of, of, of wealth that's coming down. Do they down. actually say cascade? Oh, yes, that's the word they prefer. OK. Uh, that's coming down to the, to the next generation, which obviously they view as a very positive thing. Um, and as somebody who has had very little ever cascade um, <laughs> down to me, um, I obviously take a bit of, a, of, of an issue with this. And I think this is really at the nub of, of, of your report about wealth inequality. Because the fact is, the biggest predictor of whether you will go on to own a house is if your parents um, own a house. We talk about BOMAD, the bank of mum and dad. We've also got the subsidiary of BOGAG, the bank of gran and granddad, um, who are passing on... <laughs> Um, these property deposits and of course because of inheritance tax and the way it works if you make gifts within your lifetime you don't pay any tax if you're giving out of existing income doesn't matter if you die within seven years you're not going to pay any tax whereas if I go out and earn money um, at the moment I'm getting bloody 60% tax so you can probably work out what earnings bracket I'm in um, from that but believe me it's um, and you're very happy about it's that it's not fun I'm very lucky uh, <laughs> privileged to, to be taxed at that high rate but my point is the way we tax capital and the way we tax income if you don't have wealthy parents um, behind you is a further disadvantage so my excellent colleague John Byrne Murdoch um, at the Financial Times if you don't read his data points column and follow him on Twitter you should definitely do that he calculated recently that a 35 year old with parents who rent i.e who cannot give this um, housing wealth accumulated cascade uh, to their next generation. Um, if you're 35 and you have parents that rent, you will need to earn around £25,000 a year more than your contemporaries with homeowning parents in order to have the same shot of getting on 
the housing ladder. And I think this, this is the issue. Plus, you've got to be a dink. Have you heard this term? No. A dink is a double income, no kids. So you don't have the aberration of childcare costs to pay for, because you haven't yet reproduced. And you have two people who will be paying towards this huge mortgage. Now, there's a very interesting story on the BBC News website um, this weekend. Um, a woman who is quite young, 26, but she's managed to save up £50,000 um, by living at home with her parents, which Has is another that? trend, because she's not paying any rent. Mm -hmm. um, but she still can't buy a house because she's single. Um, and I, I picked you up at the beginning saying, oh, younger people can't afford to get mortgages. But also, this is an increasing problem for older people um, who've got divorced, so they're no longer a dink. I don't know what the acronym would be for somebody who's divorced, has had their finances put through the, the washing machine of life and then has to try and somehow split this household wealth. Um, there are also lots more older people who are renting um, further into old age, which, of mm -hmm. course, makes a mockery of all of these um, living standards assumptions that the PLSA and others yeah. come out with because they will assume that you've paid off your mortgage and don't have any um, housing costs. So definitely a reset is needed. I'm sure that lots of um, younger people um, looking at your graph um, about what might happen to house prices will be saying, yes, um, bring it on. But equally, there's going to be people who've got on the housing ladder more recently, you know, that 35 to 45 year old. Um, big red spike in terms of the amount of debt that they've taken on to get on the housing ladder are going to be very fearful of that because if the value of your asset goes down this is going to really badly affect you in many ways um, I mean it could more immediately affect how well you're able to um, restructure any mortgage debt if you are going to mm -hmm. get into arrears and certainly millions of people are predicted to be we've got the mortgage charter to try and encourage people to speak to their lenders ahead of time but ultimately Lots of people who've used, ironically, these government schemes designed to get single people, lower income people onto the housing ladder. I'm thinking about help to buy and also shared ownership. They're the ones who've been able to get onto the ladder by being sanctioned to borrow even more, um, often on the value of new build um, housing, which hasn't held up as well um, as others, often leasehold, a whole other argument. So why we have held on to this idea of um, you know, property being the route to wealth, as you see in that um, diagonal line on your first chart, is because we've sort of div become divorced from the idea that um, property is about having a place to live, about having security of tenure. Certainly anyone renting at the moment will know exactly what I'm talking about, especially if you're renting with kids, which is even worse. But somehow it's become about wealth. Um, you know, you're, you're not owning a property, you're investing in a property, even if it's your own home. Um, like the, the inheritance aspect and having this belief that, you know, house prices will keep on doubling in 10 years. So it doesn't matter if you're taking on this huge debt because it's, it's an asset, you're building up something for your future. That is all going to unravel if what this report is um, predicting is true. And most definitely a reset is, is needed, but that's not going to come without cost to, to, to some younger people who really struggle to get on the ladder and also with renters who, who are really struggling at the moment. A GP came to um, this debate about housing that I did for um, Radio 4 the other night, not to name drop, but she made an excellent point afterwards off mic and she said, like, I'm a GP in East London, she said, every single day I get somebody in my surgery um, with a mental health crisis caused by rental housing. Now, it could be somebody who is being evicted um, by a private landlord because the housing benefit doesn't um, go anywhere near to covering the rent. Um, she also gave me an example of a person who was forced to live with um, an abusive partner because they couldn't afford to, to split up. I know you need me to finish, so I will. So what are the solutions? Um, I think a build-to-rent sector, I've said this before, but I'll say it again, I think we need much better rental um, housing and not just for, for the poorest, like for social housing, but for people who are professionals um, who need that security of tenor, tenure, need somewhere safe um, and well managed to live, but don't necessarily need um, to, to own. And then as for um, this issue about, about wealth taxes, just to leave you with one final point, in the aftermath of the pandemic in 2020, we actually asked FT readers, uh, we did an online poll and said, would you be in support of a wealth tax? And interestingly, more than half of them were. But when we said, where should it come in? Uh, most of them said, just above <laughs> um, the, the level of, of, of wealth that they personally enjoyed. Um, so, you know, even if we are wealthy, we don't necessarily see ourselves 
um, as, as being wealthy. But certainly housing wealth is about more than, than having an asset. It's about having security. Great. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, uh, great, lots of uh, insights from FT readers. The, um, uh, right, okay, now, we're gonna, this is a lot, right? So we're going to try and do what on earth is going on, then the impossible bit, what is going to go on, the future, and then let's try and do some policy implications, particularly on the issues the panel have raised, which is basically housing, pensions, taxation, and then other issues you guys want to raise. There's loads of questions already in, but it's hashtag rising rate on Slido if you want to come on. So just let's start on the what is happening right now. So the report is showing you our uh, estimate of what's happened to household wealth up to the beginning of this year. Right? So quarter one, 2023, where most of the action, the change in that wealth is being driven by the effective interest rates on bond prices, most of it, yeah, which is feeding through to pensions. As Ian said, then in some way that it, at that point you haven't seen loads of this feed through into house prices, um, but if interest rates stay where they are, the model, uh, the modeling, wider modeling is suggesting house price falls of twenty five percent nominal. That is, so obviously it's bigger real falls over the coming years. The um, so let's just on the what is happening now. So David, what's your what's your how do you think we should think about this? Should we think about this as we've had lots of the bond? We're going to come back later to interest rate uncertainty. So let's just assume we're in the kind of, rather than second guessing the bank of England, we're all basically where we are. Do you think the next big thing is just the house prices coming down? Well, I, I, as you say, I, I think they're already coming down a bit, yeah. uh, not, not, not very much. Um, but even, even the nominal declines in average house prices in the UK that we've seen, some people say it's 2 or 3%, some yeah. people say it's more like 5 or 6 Given that consumer prices have gone up over the last year by close to 10%, in real terms, relative to consumer prices, I mean, house prices are already down you know, 15% or so. Um, might that have further still to go? Uh, I think it's plausible. We all know that um, people on uh, fixed rate mortgages, the majority of them haven't yet seen the big increase that's coming. That's going to be difficult to pe for people to manage. Uh, and people who were expecting to take out mortgages and maybe get a fixed rate at three or four percent are now facing, you know, six or seven. So it's going to hit the demand for houses from new buyers uh, and people who uh, are selling one house, even if their fixed rate doesn't run out. If they sell a house and try and buy another one, they're almost certainly remortgaging at a much higher rate. So I think this has got some way still to run. I don't think it's implausible that in a world where, if we are now in a world where real interest rates, real interest rates are just going to be significantly higher than they've been for most of the last 10 years or so, that that has a very substantial impact on the real value of houses. Um, we probably haven't seen most of that adjustment yet. But the big question, I'm sure we're yeah. going to come back to it, is are we in a world just of temporarily higher nominal interest rates and real interest rates? Uh, and this will unwind and we'll go back to something close to where we were a couple of years ago, a couple of years down the road, in which case, of course, the, the effect on house prices is likely to be a bit temporary. But I know we're yeah, going to come back. We're to definitely that. going to come back to that. The, um, have you, are you starting to get a reader starting to ask you, how much is my house coming down? <laughs> are they starting? They're, 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 they always been start, doing They never stopped, they're, they're starting, <laughs> even when they were going up. I think in the, in the immediate um, sense, the fear is more my mortgage is going up by more than I can afford. Yeah. Um, but certainly, it's like you say, the house price coming down, it doesn't really affect you until you need to realise that asset, either because you're, yeah. because you're moving or because you know, you're selling it to go into, into a retirement home. But certainly... There is a lot of hope and expectation amongst younger people who are not yet on the ladder that house prices will come down, and no more so that those who are struggling to save up a deposit when rents um, are so excruciatingly high. And of course, even if the value of um, properties do fall and mortgage rates are higher for longer, making it higher to, um, harder for, for people to pay those bills month to month, it's still going to hand an advantage to those who are getting BOMAD um, or BOGAG to help out because they'll have a smaller mortgage because they've had a larger deposit. I've never heard of BOGAG before. Well, you know. I may be it soon. Oh, right. Okay. I'm now Very... a grandmother. Oh, right. Congratulations. <laughs> the, um, don't give it all away yet. The, um, right, okay. Let's, let's take a lot of what we're discussing and do it a different way, which is, so 
you've all pointed out in different ways that in some ways some of this stuff is value some of this what's happening here is valuation effects the exact assets are the same assets they're worth different amounts because of changes in interest rates and the discount rate right the question is how much does that matter to real people the paper is saying it does matter over time even if it doesn't matter to the collective because of the distribution effect particularly across generations and then within the generations which is how the intergenerational effects play out so let's do let's do each generation you can each do so let's do boomers, millennials, and zoomers, the young ones. We're going to forget. Zoomers. We're going, I, think, I don't know what it's called, the young one, the youth. Um, we're going to ignore Gen X because everybody does. Um, now, uh, the, um, for simplicity sense, because it gets too complicated. So let's do, let's do, Dale, I'm going to give you boomers. You can do the millennials, mm -hmm. and you can do some zoomers because you can get some good news at the end. So like, what, what does this mean for, again, let's not get into the uncertain interest rates. Let's assume we're in a higher interest rate world. Yeah. What's happening to the boomers, David? Hold on, how old are boomers again? I always get confused. Boomers are like just, they're enjoying the, they're just, they're into retirement slash a bit retired by now. Right, okay. Um, well, to some extent, probably not an enormous impact. This is on average, of course, some people yep. will be different. Um, I mean, people who are, you know, 60s going into their 70s, they're probably not moving house at least so, certainly not as much as they did yeah. when they were in their sort of twenties and thirties, uh, and they and they've probably also paid off the mortgage. So the money value of the house is of less significance than if you are younger and you were about to trade up. The family's got bigger; you need a bigger house, and all that. Where actually, actually, of course, you're slightly better off if house prices fall. But I mean, the, the older generation is probably less affected by that. Um, if somebody's lucky enough to have been in receipt of a DB pension, and as long as the sponsor of the company doesn't go bankrupt, your, your income from your pension is not going to change much either. Uh, so actually, they're probably more insulated than most other generations, in, in the sense that they're neither, neither better off nor worse off. If, if you've got savings in... Um, in cash in a bank, then I mean, even though there's a two there's a two way effect because people focus on the nominal interest rate. I was getting zero before, but now and now I'm getting six percent. I'm better off. But inflation's you know eight point seven percent right now in the UK. Now hopefully it'll come down quite a lot. So there hasn't actually been that big a change in the real interest rate on your cash either. So I think of all your generations, you they, boomers, they may well be the least affected. So that's the economist answer. What do you think they're going to feel like if the house price comes down by 25%? As far as they were Dep planning some boom gagging or depends, whatever. Depends how, qu how often they go to Zoopla and try and work out the value of the house. Um, if they've got any sense, they won't do that very often and therefore won't be too upset. Um, <laughs> if, 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 however, I mean, they worry a lot about the value of the house because they're concerned about the children and the grandchildren, well, there's a one, this is Ricardian equivalence. I mean, there's, there's a wonderful offset. You know, I'm going to leave them less money, but they, can but buy they house need for less. less money. Okay, very good. Okay, so basically boomers yeah. insulated more broadly than others, yeah. more than the others. And, right. and the other advantage boomers have got is um, annuity rates. Because if they don't yep. have a DB pension, yep. they can so buy a much better income. Explain to people. So an annuity is when you buy an income stream with your pension pot. So you trade all or part of it for um, an income that you'll get every every month until you die, like a salary. And um, up until, well, in a, in a low rates era, the rates on annuities God. have been crap, that's a technical term. Um, and now <laughs> um, you can expect to get, you know, Some. six, seven percent. Um, so, you know, much more attractive. So many more people are interested in, in, in buying them. Right, now, millennials. millennials. <laughs> okay. And let's do a caricature of millennials. So they've all like, let's do the ones that have managed to buy, but have a Okay. Chunky mortgage. What's happened yeah. to them? So, so um, well, if you're a dink, a double income, no kids, and obviously you've got more financial resi resilience. Um, if you're a sick, a single income with kids, because one of you has had to um, go part time or stop working. Or, or poor, as it's known. Well, exactly. Um, and you've got childcare costs on top. Um, they are the readers who are contacting me saying, we don't know what we're going to do. I mean, one of them described to me in my column at the weekend, 
we know our fixed rate mortgage is going to end, our repayments are going to go from 800 months to 1600 while the reader is on maternity leave. And she said it's like a snowball, you can sort of see it coming down the mountainside um, towards you, but there's nothing you can do about it. Well, with the mortgage charter, of course, there is um, things that you can do about it, but inevitably it's going to involve stretching out the debt for even longer. So 40-year mortgage terms um, are now the norm. My youngest stepson is 26. He recently bought um, a house in Harlow in Essex with his partner. All of these kind of areas are being opened up, um, children you know, moving out of London, going to to these kind of hubs and Harlow's definitely, um, you know, it's on TikTok. It's pretty popular. Harlow is on TikTok. There you go. I didn't realise I didn't realize TikTok had to get to places. I One thought the interweb did that. This, from this right. seminar, Harlow is now, is now trendy because it's because it's cheap. So they've gone there, but mortgage broker said 40-year mortgage. Um, I worked out for them if they each overpay £100 each per month, they'll knock about eight years um, off, off that mortgage. So I bloody hope they're doing it. Um, but for many other couples, it was it's the get out it's of jail free card. If you have yeah. 25, it will become 30, and so on and so forth. But that's just, that's so that's, if you have already if you have current already values, bought, then yeah. you end up on longer terms because yeah. you've got to deal with the higher interest exactly. costs. Right. So it will cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds potentially more on, on a London yeah. home over the lifetime of earning that. If you haven't bought yet. Um, then obviously there could be advantages and that will extend um, to your Zuma group. Um, but that's assuming that you've got okay. enough of a deposit. Very good. And well, one thing is uh, this extension thing is quite important. Like when we're discussing monetary policy, your old world, David, we're, at the moment we're all saying, look, it's taking longer to feed through because of fixed term mortgages. Mm. Insofar as people margin of adjustment is the length of the term rather than the monthly payment, actually yeah. the, the effect of the, because you're deferring all the income pain, or the cost pain to later in the mortgage rather than taking it out front. Are we actually going to get even longer delays to monetary policy feeding through? Uh, I think there's something in that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Let's do some good news. Does anybody want to self identify in the room as a Zoomer? Young. Anyone self identifying as young? Come on, some of you are young. I can actually see. Can, can I right. make one very final small point on pensions? Yes. Of course, if you're yes. throwing everything at the mortgage, there's less to throw at the pension, as I'm sure my mm. former colleague Norma will, will tell you. One of the reasons I have paid so much money into my pension is because of that lady sitting there. Okay, not, not people watching don't know who is in the room, so tell, explain um, why. Norma Cohen, who was the pensions correspondent of the FT for many years and provided invaluable ad hoc advice. Um, to young staff. Although she was not regulated, <laughs> so she obviously wasn't providing investment advice in case anyone from the FCA Guidance. is watching. Guidance! Please be careful to say, I'm not giving you advice. Exactly. Right. Do the math for that. Okay, right, now that we're not in any legal danger, keep going. <laughs> yeah, so obviously if you're throwing everything at the mortgage, you've got less to throw at mm. things like workplace pensions where you do get the advantage yeah. of the employer. Or indeed on. the avocados. Indeed. Yeah. On which subject? Yeah, so I think that's a key point on the, on the millennials, Claire. It's like, it really depends. You know, you've got pros and cons in terms of if you've already bought and you're not planning to trade up, you're getting hammered on housing, but you're benefiting from pensions and it's reducing the amount you can contribute, but you don't need to contribute as much, so that's a wash. But for Gen Z, I think, you know, ultimately, you're looking at lower house prices, you're looking at lower contributions to achieve a decent standard of retirement. That's all great news. The one group for whom it's not good news for is if you're relying on a big inheritance. To, uh, if you're relying on your own resources, your own labour income to save up these things, that's all good news. So you're, you're, you're net perky for the Zoomers, the Gen Zers. Yeah. Very good. Right. OK, let's quickly just run through a few questions people are asking. Then, so, David, why don't you take this one? Because it's on the subject we're raising, which is on... Um, should we be, like, insofar as policymakers are asking, should we be trying to insulate any mortgage holders from these rises in rates at all? Beyond the, like, asking the lenders to behave nicely, charter, reasonableness, blah. But should anyone be, should policy do anything else to insulate? Well, there, 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 there's an argument um, that goes like this, which says if, if, if increases in interest rates, nominal interest rates, are largely a reflection of increases in inflation, then obviously the impact that has on the monthly mortgage payment you have is could be potentially enormous. I mean, that could mm -hmm. double, triple, even though inflation may have only gone from, you know, three or four percent to five or six percent. And that generates a big change in the profile of when you pay off the mortgage. Because if inflation stays high and you're, do, you're paying on a standard mortgage, you're actually paying in real terms the mortgage off very quickly. So it, in the US, they call it the tilt problem. Um, in other words, you tilt the, the real cost of the payments early on in the life of the mortgage and you turn around in five, 10 years time with much higher inflation. Gosh, you've just paid off nearly all in real terms the mortgage. Now that sounds okay, well, it, but it's not okay if you 
your your income profile doesn't allow you to do that. And there is there is a strong argument of allowing people some flexibility of changing the profile. And that's why I think it is helpful okay. that the lenders in the UK have said, well, we may allow people to extend the term of the mortgage, maybe go through a period of interest only repayments. Um, I mean, so far, I think it's been a sort of voluntary agreement by the mortgage lenders. But I, th I think actually that is rather helpful. And they're basically doing that anyway, aren't they? I mean, lenders have they may well have, years they, moved they, may, they may well have been it's doing it. It's only 85% of them who've signed up to yeah. that shelter. It's the, the people who are doing high cost of credit lending, yeah. legacy kind of mortgage prisoner type products are the ones who haven't said yes, as yeah. I understand it. Right, Ian, you can take this one from Nicholas, which is basically what's the regional effect uh, of these big changes in wealth? Like, it doesn't look the same. Everywhere house prices haven't beha behaved in the same way over the last... 20 years across the country, what, give us the region. We're not going to go through every single region, but give us a flavour. Well, that is, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately, we've seen yield, housing yields fall much more in London and the South East than they have elsewhere. So you, that might lead you to expect that the correction will be much bigger there. Um, although, you know... If, if everyone, I'm just like, I'm worried about the words housing yields and people died at the back. So, like, so what, what we're actually <laughs> we talking about, what does it mean to people, punters? So effectively, this is, uh, well, we're talking prices, really. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the, the yield is the rent you can get on a house divided by the price of the house. And um, that's what goes down when interest rate goes down, and that's what goes up when interest rates go up. And so we could expect, we, that would tell you everything will shift in the same direction to the same degree across the whole country. But since yields and, uh, have fallen more in London, prices have risen more relative to earnings, that might tell you that you can expect a bigger adjustment there, but it's very uncertain, I think. I mean, even the national thing is very uncertain, so what, what we can say regionally, I don't know. But London's definitely much more exposed. Yep, the, um, I think on most models, we should see larger house price falls hmm. in the greater southeast. Has everyone agreed on that? Sorry, you probably, those of you watching elsewhere in the country, Lucky happy days. Right now, let's do the government briefly. So most of the paper is about household wealth generally, okay? But what does the government think about all this? The, um, so here's the first poll for you to vote on. As I said, it's Slido and it's hashtag rising rates. Uh, so the, um, what should the government make of all of this? Should they be most worried about people's mortgages going up, what we were just discussing? That's why the Chancellor's holding the meetings uh, with lenders. Um, the OBR did a great report last week on their fiscal risks, was it fiscal risks and sustainability is now called, isn't it? Yes. Report last week, which had a whole a chapter. Uh, it's not very perky reading uh, for the government, at least. But anyway, on government debt, the, um, which basically said uh, government debt interest costs are up a lot because of a, a whole range of factors contributing to it being particularly large in the UK. That's why your taxes are going up. The, um, is it because people, when people's houses start coming down in value, they're going to be really angry? Or, or is there actually not a problem for the government? This is all good news because the Zoomers are going to be happy and the Conservative voter base is obviously 25-year-olds. Um, so, which one of those do you think it is? Let's go down the panel. Claire, why don't you go first? Which is the biggest problem? I think the cost of government debt going up, because the number of people with mortgages is actually surprisingly small yeah. as a percentage of the overall population, partly because so many people have <laughs> paid theirs off. Um, and then, as you say, the numbers who are still on an advantageous um, rate is insulating that problem. But the cost of government debt, they've already ruled out tax cuts um, for the next election, which is going to be a big, a big problem. No more tax related bribes. And they have got this situation with, you know, public sector wages, creaking government departments, pretty much everything, so needing one, more money. OK, very good. So just, and just I want to say the reason why you've got Conservative Party basically backing off tax cuts and the Labour Party backing off as much investment in green stuff is basically this. It is the debt interest news that has turned up and made the public finances. So like this is a real thing for policy. It's not just a um, thing. Ian, what are you going for? Well, I was going to go for the cost of government debt too, but that's a bit boring. boring. So I'll go for people's mortgages going up because I think while well, Claire's right that the pain is very concentrated on a small group of people because people we mean thirty percent of longer. the population roughly. Don't we? Yeah, and and not all of them rolling over onto new rates every year. But I think that the extent of that pain and the sort of feeling of unju mm -hmm. injustice that creates creates a real political headache for them, um, which is probably much bigger than the house price effects themselves. So I, I think that is a political big problem for them okay. running into twenty. David. 
What's your one? Um, bottom of the list in terms of what's the real problem, price of people's houses going down. So I, I wouldn't count that as, as, in broad terms, there are exceptions, the big problem, because yep. the, true, the true value of a house, in a sense, hasn't changed because interest rates change. Um, and you may lose a bit because you were about to sell and trade down, but you know, your children or grandchildren, if you've got them, are better off. So it, it, that's not the big problem. Um, I, I, I think the cost of mortgages going up is, is an issue because of what we spoke about a little bit earlier, which is just what I would call the front end loading problem or the tilt problem. People are paying off in real terms, much more of the mortgage very quickly, which, pe which some people will find it very difficult to live with. I mean, the cost of government debt going up is not trivial. I mean, the stock of debt in government debt in the UK is, up, is not far off 100% of GDP. And the cost of that debt has gone up a great deal in the last um, 12 months or so. The, um, so we're, up, we're, up, we're spending 2% more of GDP on debt interest than we were yeah, pre-pandemic. That's, pandemic. that's so big. That's, that's big. a lot of money. The, um, right, okay, let's see what the punters are most worried about on behalf of the government. Look, look how Treasury civil servant you all are. <laughs> the, uh, um, yeah, I think that, that probably is actually what they're most worried about in the short term. The, um, uh, there is a slight danger that, that with the pub, pub, as we move towards an election, obviously the cost of government debt becomes less of an issue and the punters become the issue. The mortgages going up affecting a third of highly squeezed people like but they are like richer millennials they're the ones that vote disproportionately mm -hmm. price i think you're all very chilled about what how angry old people are going to be when their house prices start coming down i'm worried that they do look at zoopla <laughs> no is some old people older people here Ooh. very relaxed there you go. totally chilled there you go. Totally, totally chilled this guy's completely relaxed nearly horizontal lady with her hand up but <laughs> right. let's see have we got a microphone let's have a question from the lady here you can tell us how chilled you are as well. I mean, it's quite cold in here, so you might actually be chilled, but. Um, I'm personally chilled, but I think there's a lot of um, uh, Tory older voters who'd be outraged. I don't, wouldn't share their outrage. In fact, I'd be slightly gleeful about their outrage. But you're gleeful about their outrage, okay, fine. I was more worried, I'm looking for someone who was gleeful about, let's have a question here as well, the, um, or, or even just a statement. And then we're going to go to what on earth do we do about all of this? I mean, to, to what extent is uh, the reduction in housing equity uh, a problem for people who exactly. are relying on it for their social care? Mm. Yes, that is a very good question. So one thing, let's, let's broaden that slightly into like, what are the policy implications of falling housing equity? So there's paying for social care mm -hmm. is one um, uh, big one. There's not, not being able to use equity release as a get out of jail card for not having. So there's like cope. There's like using savings. it as a pension. Yep. Use it as a pension. There's inheritance tax revenues and stamp duty revenues for the government, which are obviously highly geared off house prices, basically, because that's what's in them. The um, so wh where where does it show up? So that's, these are things that aren't on the list, but like the, the old the millennials who've highly mortgaged themselves are going to be really angry about the falls in their the minimal equity they've got, but. On other things, Ian, what are the, which ones should we most worry about? Tax receipts coming down for the wealth-related taxes, or no one can pay for their social care anymore, or they can't use it as a pension? Well, I think those two things are really important. We tend to think that people just amass all this wealth and then just pass it on to their kids, and they don't see any uh, value from selling it. But on, on the whole, they do. So DB pensions aside, where someone else has taken the risk, they do often have to sell these assets and use them in some way. And that is going to be a massive problem. Uh, I mean, all of those kind of like age wealth charts show the wealth coming down at the end of life, and it comes down for a reason. So if the value of that wealth has just shrunk, that's a big problem, I think, for a lot of people. Well, probably for a minority of people, but it's a very big problem for them. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, the rise of, of products like Rio mortgages, that's retirement interest-only mortgages, um, and then equity release. Wait, so, wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> so this is where you can... So you've, you've got a house, say it's worth £400,000, and you think, well, actually, I'd quite like to be able to take some money, some equity out of that house um, in order to live on it, because maybe my mm -hmm. pension income isn't so great, or you know, I just want to go to Barbados, frankly. Um, so retirement interest only mortgage, you're just paying the interest um, on a loan, which is granted to older people. The mortgage mm -hmm. company knows that eventually they'll sell their house and they'll get their money back that way okay. when you die. And then equity release, you're not paying anything 
um, you're just taking that money, the yeah. interest is rolling up, the mortgage comes. So there's different ways of getting equity money. So it's to ways of leveraging your your home in order to provide you as an income or to give your children. Do we think lots of that is happening? Oh yes. I mean, if you look at the, um, yeah. you know, the graphs of like how many people have been using this, but you know, it just goes up and up. But also younger people who've remortgaged because the value of the house has gone up, um, you know, because they want to get their teeth done, or they want to have an extension. That's you know, not very is... British. We're getting our teeth done. Yes, I know quite a few people who've so done nothing that. Nothing sacred anymore. It costs about 40 the, grand. The knackered British teeth as an institution <laughs> needs to be protected from all this yeah. progress. Right, okay, good. Let's do the big thing, which is like uncertainty. So for what, what on earth is going to happen to interest rates? So here's a poll question to kick us off, but then I want to go to what do policymakers do with the fact that Ian's just shown us loads of charts which show household wealth either alternatively going up further towards like 10 times GDP or coming down to five times. There's a large range, right? A lot of uncertainty about what that means for asset prices. What do policymakers do with that? But first of all, what matters for that is what happens to interest rates in the medium term. So it's not about second guessing the Bank of England right now. It's about what's the medium term path for interest rates. So here's the question. Who is right on medium term, so five years plus interest rate expectations? Is it the traders? So like markets currently expect interest rates to be in a new world compared to what they thought, well, actually a new world even compared to six months ago for the medium term, but like, uh, you know, staying at kind of four half percent rather than one percent the um, far out. Is it economists who I think generally now expect interest rates to fall back further than markets expect? Or is it us humans who haven't got a clue uh, what is going to happen? Right, David, who are you with? Uh, I think I'm with the economists in the sense that's very loyal of you. That <laughs> well, they're a really mixed bunch of economists. So um, anyway, I, I suspect that what we're seeing in the UK at the moment, which has been disappointing, obviously inflation has, has stayed at 8.7 for a couple of months. We thought you know six months ago it might be down to six or seven now, and it hasn't done that. Who knows where it'll be by the end of this week? We get a number on Wednesday, I think. Yeah. Um, I suspect that that's partly just slower pass through mm -hmm. because a lot of companies have seen input prices flat to falling in recent months and that's not flowed through yet to consumer prices. Um, so I think inflation will drop back. Um, it's just going to be a bit slower than we thought. Therefore, if you said where, 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 where might bank rate be three or four years from now as opposed to six months from now, um, I suspect it's not going to be at the 6% that people think it might be by Christmas. Um, you know, who knows whether that means we get back to, you know, 1% or 2%, which historically would be extremely low, or 4 to 5 which is more like the long-term average for bank rates in the UK. Um, and there is, you know, a material difference between 1 and 2 and 4 to 5 But will we be at, you know, 6 and mortgage rates at, seven or eight no i don't think so Claire, mm. who are you with <clears throat> well i'm more with the traders that uk rates will will stay stay high i'll caveat that um i think it's really interesting looking at what's happening to inflation in the us compared to what's happening over here um exactly thank you uh, three percent in the us 8.7 percent here um i believe joe biden has started tweeting well he hasn't obviously due to being 80-something, but uh, uh, Joe Biden is tweeting charts of inflation rates <laughs> across the G7, which show like the US, this lovely line, and then this lovely red line for the UK, which I'm sure Rishi Sunak is really appreciating now, from his I have to say, uh, in your favour, I read a very interesting column by my former colleague, um, Marin Somerset Webb, actually, sorry, I'll tell a lie, it was a podcast. Um, she thinks that inflation is set to, to plummet and certainly you know there are very interesting arguments about what could happen what, what what couldn't happen with this but for a lot of people who are fixing their mortgage because they want the certainty and are locking into mm -hmm. five years um at, you know five percent six percent yeah people are doing that stop doing hum that. human nature like if tells us, you know, certainty, knowing even if you've got to pay more per month, knowing what you've got to pay for the next five years and being able to sleep at night, even if it's going to make you poorer, is better for many people. If you are in a position where financially you're more able to gamble and roll yeah. the dice and lots of people with less money just feel that they can't. We saw exactly the same thing Scary. with energy contracts when yep. the energy yep. prices started going and people thought, I'm going to fix now because it could get worse and mm. then it will get even worse for okay, me. So you're going for, the, you're going for so, the traders because you think Britain's a bit yeah. stuffed on inflation coming down. I, I think that we have more issues. Right. Ian, you give us a very quick answer because I want to 
Okay, so I used to be with The Economist. I'm thinking more and more you might be with the, right with the traders. I mean, look, interest rates have fallen because uh, investment around the world has, has fallen. Uh, and there's lots of forces that are pushing that in the opposite direction. You've got Bidenomics in the US driving massive investment. You've got a massive drive globally for net zero. You've got trade fragmentation happening. You've got rearmament happening around the world. There's, a, I think, a very plausible story that that drives up global interest rates in the long term and leaves us in the... Uh, the trade is the right world. Excellent. Right. We'll all enjoy that. So that's our that's our five hundred percent of GDP for wealth yeah. and house prices coming down more than the twenty five percent. The um, well, depending on how slow it happens, but possibly coming down even further. Right. Let's see what you all thought on the voting public. I uh, see. I think that I'm see. I'm going for democracy here. The, no one knows is obviously the right answer. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the right answer. <laughs> so well done. The punters have won. That is, although it's obviously a cop out. You, um, so we wouldn't have let you guys get away with that because that life's not fair. So right. Let's so let's take the right answer, which is no one knows, and then say what's the. I'll go around each of you. But what's the main lesson for policymakers? So in a world where we don't know, in a kind of quite different like a, in a wide range. We're not like, oh, we don't know where interest rates are going to be. Are they going to be up or down by like half a percent over 10 years or something that we've been living with for the last 10 years? But instead, we're like, we don't know what the regime is. We don't know whether it's, you know, there's the paper from the Fed out last week saying, actually, we'll see even further falls in equilibrium interest rates below the basically zero that we were used to, where people were writing speeches about pre-pandemic. There's another lot of people saying, you know, it goes even higher. Ian's just given you the like, it's structurally kind of 6%. Mm. Oh, there's the like middle of the road. Take the... 50 year view, four and five percent is perfectly normal. Maybe we just end up back there. So these are, but these are like totally different worlds. So give us one lesson from each of you on what policymakers should do with that fact, apart from saying economists are no use to me whatsoever. The, um, so Ian, you've had time to write a paper on it, so you can go first. What's the one thing you want policymakers to take away from that? Well, I think the main thing they have to take away is that that low rates world, however unlikely you may think it is, is a very bad place to be for politics, for intergenerational equality, for all sorts of things. So now we've had this ab abating of these forces. We need to think now about what the whole policy agenda looks like across all those things I mentioned to lean against some of those things because you don't want to get, it's very hard to undo once you get into a world where wealth is very concentrated among a small group of people. It's going to wreck your politics, it's going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of decisions. And so I think <coughs> that's why you've got to think now about the whole wealth agenda quick. Okay, what do you want to do about that? Uh, all the things I said in my slide. All right, very good. <laughs> Excellent cop out, that was not one thing. But I just, like, I just did to draw out from the, Ian's slide earlier, because I think the interesting thing is, like, there's a lot. It's quite, it's quite easy to know what the policy answer is to interest rates are much higher, right? Or interest rates are much lower. Mm -hmm. What's harder to know what to do about from policymakers is the level of interest rates and therefore asset prices is very uncertain. But like, that's the hard bit for policymakers to wrestle with. Like we discussed one of that, like how much pressure can asset values take in paying for social care versus taxes of income. Those those kind of it's the uncertainty for policymakers mm -hmm. that is the hard bit to wrestle with. Now, Claire, what's your, what do you, what do you, what do you like Jeremy Hunt to take away from this? Well, I think the biggest challenge really is for housing policy. Um, let's take a step back and we're going to have a lot of people who are going to be in a lot of trouble um, with rising mortgage payments. And this six month window yeah. that the help measures give them, for many people, it's just going to be kicking the can down the road, even mm. though they've promised not to repossess anyone forcibly for 12 months. We can still see people having to sell. Um, and quit home ownership for good. And when you look at housing policy, the you know complete revolving door. I think we have something like eighteen housing ministers in the lot. It doesn't in, in the periods that. That shows how important we. You know, we've put eighteen people in there. There hasn't That's been how consistency, is. and there hasn't been vision. Um, yeah. And I think it's never been more needed, especially with alternatives to um, trading debt for dreams, which is what yeah. young people have been forced to do. David, what's your, what do you want? The as recently as 12 months ago, there were a lot of um, people arguing that it didn't really matter all that much that the stock of government debt in the UK, and indeed in many other countries, was 100% of GDP, and in other countries, some of the countries, a lot more than that. And it didn't matter because the real cost of government debt, real interest rates, were going to stay very low, uh, and that made the debt affordable. That doesn't look quite so reassuring a thought right now, and I don't think it should be a reassuring thought. Um, we don't know where real interest rates are going to go. It seems to me plausible that they will be higher for quite a long period than had seemed likely. And therefore, having a very high stock government debt relative to GDP just exposes you to a risk 
that is a greater risk mm -hmm. than we thought likely. Yeah, the, um, that's a good le overall one, which is like, the world's uncertain, you, you want to be risking yourself, and your yep. government is generally a mm -hmm. thing worth thinking about. Yeah. Let's, let's end with a question that I'm going to use as a question, but, the, um, but just to make uh, <coughs> to how this manifested, because we are obviously focusing here on lots of the aggregate, right? These are big like, things to the whole economy, but there's quite a few questions that are basically asking for personal financial advice, which obviously we're not going to provide, but just to show how much this matters, right, and why this is going to be a really big deal. The, um, so this person is a millennial, capital M, the, um, who's getting, buying their house next month. They've got a good five-year fix, I presume that means they booked it a while back yeah like why are transactions in the housing market still happening because lots of people have a mortgage offer from like six months ago that's on a lower rate and they're like i might as well go ahead because if i don't i'm going to lose that and i'm going to be on a six percent mortgage obviously the downside of that is they're not waiting for the house price falls to come through the um now obviously we can't offer financial advice <laughs> but claire if you work. were a hypothetical millennial in yeah. a situation like this would you be completing well, they used to say, you know, buying a dog is for life. It's not just for Christmas. And, you know, buying a house is for life. So this person, they're about to um, complete um, a first-time purchase for five years. They're going to have an advantageous yeah. interest rate, but they're worrying that this fall in house prices um, is going to wipe them out. I mean, what have we seen when house prices have fallen in the past? You know, they have come back. And you really have to think about this as a place that you want to live, a secure roof over your head, not where a landlord can kick you out, um, but you know, somewhere where you'll be able to live for a long time. Oh, no, this is old fashioned. This is an old fashioned, like we're clapping and things. Like, not everyone's on the zooming land. Right, and also they like about that. how lucky you are. How lucky you are, okay, fine. All right, that's, so you're basically go ahead. Well, person. presumably the reasons why they want to buy a house are because they want those things, you know, they want yeah. security. Okay. But if they start thinking about it as like a lottery ticket, Okay then that's obviously... Okay, just to give the counter example, counter argument, they might be able to retire five years later, mm. but because, might have to retire five years later because they can't pay off the mortgage because they don't wait for the 25% house price falls to come through. I mean, one, one thing that I would say to the millennial, if you're using help to buy, if that yeah. is still indeed a thing, a thing um, there are some that are still available. Um, and if you're buying a leasehold property as opposed to a freehold property, Just then they're things, they're things to think about. Well, it, it, as long as you go into these things with your eyes open and you know, and you know about the risks. Okay. But if you think if saving for longer, building up a bigger deposit, hoping that house prices will fall further, it depends whether you can live rent-free with a parent or whether you're being charged a lot of rent by a private landlord. Okay, very good. Okay, the, um, look, we've covered a lot of ground there and we obviously haven't offered advice to the um, two millennials, but yes, you would be mad to complete. Um, and moving on. Now, the, um, let's just do final thoughts about how big a deal is this actually going to be for British politics or are we going to be in two years' time just thinking none of this matters, it's all about... I don't know, Russia, something else entirely, or is this like an actual big back thing that does shape our politics uh, and then let's release everyone to their, um, their day? So Ian, is this a big deal or is this a small deal? Yeah, so I think it's a big deal. Um, I think it's a big deal, but it's also, it may be that things evolve in a benign way for now, but I think what the last 40 years has told us is that these changes can be massive, and when they occur, the politics gets very difficult very quickly. So I think we just need to think about how do you prepare for that world of inevitable uncertainty, and that's really the key message of the Great. Data. Claire, big deal, small deal, other deal? It's a massive deal because it affects everyone, um, you know, all the generations for all the reasons that we've said, and I think this link to property and prosperity is why it's such a massive deal because like you know if our house goes up in value we feel richer and the reverse happens the opposite is, is, is it you give, you give your overall answer to wrap up but then there's also other thing which is you know we haven't seen any proper income growth for quite a while in britain no wage growth since the late 2000s the um, in real terms the um, but rising wealth has been, to some degree, compensated how we feel about that, even if it doesn't compensate for how we actually, our actual living standards. So do you think that the emotional feeling for individuals as well as the actual economics of it are a big deal? I mean, I think it's a big deal in the sense that there are gainers and losers from yeah. these asset price shifts. And it's a big deal individually which group you're in. Yeah. Um, so it redistributes stuff. In, in some sense, in aggregate... I think it, it washes out, but that doesn't mean it doesn't cause problems just because it redistributes stuff. And now it may, it may be that on balance, the redistribution is toward those with mm -hmm. currently holding less wealth. Yeah. Um, and that makes it quite difficult to answer the question. Is, is this a catastrophe or is this quite a good thing? And certainly it 
whenever you get a sudden big change like this, it generates problems for some people. And, and those problems for people in the mortgage market um, are, are, are really sort of first order problems. Yeah, okay. So it's a really big deal for people, even if it's not a massive deal for Britain. Yeah. Basically. Great. Okay. Well, look, I hope for we're, we're going to find out basically one, what on earth does happen to interest rates and whether or not it is a big deal for people. But what is definitely a big deal is that we've learned a lot from our panel today. So can we all give them a round of applause and thank you very much. Great sharing. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks again to our partners at Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust, and we'll see you all at a Resolution Foundation event soon. Have a good day. Thank <clears throat> you.